Using Hollywood storytelling uh, techniques to create winning college application essays, I feel I should introduce myself first because I'm unlike everybody pretty much here. I don't come from an education background. I'm not a teacher, although I, I was an adjunct professor, but that was for advertising. Um, this is me. I'm the COO and co-founder of Essay Dog. I went to the Newhouse School at Syracuse for a bit. I finished up and got my degree at NYU Film School. I'm, uh, by definition, a screenwriter, director, producer. Um, I did a TV pilot called Wired City, which landed me an agent. And I've been doing script rewrites, and we got into um, script consulting and built a piece of software used by about 15,000 screenwriters around the country, around the world, rather, called Plot Control. And Plot Control helps screenwriters break their story the same way Essay Dog helps high school students break their story, create their story for, for the college application. And um, it's, uh, it's not a fascinating story the way that came about, but basically my partner who uh, invented the platform helped a neighbor's son who was applying to college and had a, um, an essay that was in shambles. And the idea was, hey, you know how to write? Can you help my son? And through a couple of very basic questions, was able to delineate what the student was trying to say in the story and helped him just craft it in a way that he got into the school that he wanted to go to. He called me up immediately and said, oh my gosh, these students have the same issue that our screenwriting clients have. And screenwriters from beginning screenwriters, lawyers who want to write to established writers and producers who've done eight, nine movies and are lost on the 10th one as they were on the first one. Um, and I'm going to get into how those are similar in a moment. I won a Telly Award in 93 for a travel show I did. Uh, I was an adjunct professor at City University and I worked in corporate communications, Citigroup, KPMG, Variety.com, basically taking very boring topics, wrapping them in stories like we do, and trying to make them, uh, make them interesting. Ted, do you want to introduce yourself since your slide is up? Hi, my name is Teddy Barnes, and Howard and I are thrilled to be here uh, talking to you about uh, the college admissions and scholarship essays. We feel uh, passionate about uh, these essays and how they can uh, transform a student's candidacy. Uh, just to let you know a little bit about myself, uh, I'm a former principal and teacher, director of college counseling, and uh, do uh, some college counseling right now and um, I also am a seasonal judge for a major scholarship foundation so I review about 2,000 uh, applications and essays a year in my career I've, uh, I've uh, read over 25,000 essays and um, you know one of the things that I can tell you uh, is that um, you know when I'm reading a, a, a student's essay you know they uh, they can look so strong uh, with their extracurriculars, their letter of recommendation, uh, their academic uh, record can be sterling, and then uh, you know you can start uh, reading their essay, and you're really cheering for the student, um, and the essay can fall flat, and it can be incredibly disappointing, and it can derail a student's candidacy. And uh, some of the things that we're going to talk to today, uh, hopefully. Uh, you can you can bring back uh, and working with your students to really help help them uh, write the strongest possible essays and bring their story to life. So Howard, why don't you uh, take it over from here? Thanks so much. So he was the right guy to bring on to Essay Dog because otherwise, what would I be doing here? In terms of Essay Dog itself, you might have seen us on. The Today Show, we've been on local news, national news, Inside Higher Ed, Chicago Tribune, U.S. News, and Washington Parent. Did a lot of press because uh, people are very interested in how screenwriting applies to college application essays. When Teddy talked about reading an essay that had so much potential and then it falls flat, you can multiply that by about 120 when I read a script that has so much potential and then it falls flat. And that's about an hour and a half, two hours of time investment. So today's workshop, we're going, to just going to, we're going to really cover two things and then have Q&A. Hollywood screenwriting and application essays. And uh, Teddy's going to cover an insider's perspective, guiding your student to a winning essay. And then we'll have some Q&A. So Hollywood screenwriting and college applications. I'm trying to put myself in your head saying, huh? What is this? They're very similar in a lot of ways. And I'm just going to run through a couple right now. One is uh, about 40,000, this is actually an old number, it's probably even more now, 40,000 unsolicited screenplays pour into Hollywood every year. 
meaning these are people who just took it upon themselves to go write something. It could have taken them a week, could have taken them five years, and they send it in with the hope of someone going, this is our next big movie, you're going to be rich and famous, and the, I mean, I think winning uh, the lottery has a, a higher percentage chance of, of an unsolicited screenplay making it through to that stage. By the same token, there are about two million students applying to college, each writing at least one, sometimes 13 essays. The script by itself is just a document. It's a prospectus for a motion picture, basically saying, here's the story. You invest 20, 30, 50, a million dollars, and it's going to pour out this much on the other side. The essay is really a prospectus for a potential student coming to your campus. It's in addition to a lot of other elements, including test scores, grade point average, and so on, but it certainly stands on its own. Scripts need to be entertaining, engaging, and compelling. And the fact of the matter is, so do essays. If they're not entertaining, I don't mean entertaining like, ha ha, that's a great movie. I mean entertaining like this was an experience. You know the difference between reading a good essay and a bad essay. You know the difference between watching a great movie and a not so great movie. You come out of it thinking about it. You're thinking about it that night. It's memorable. It sticks in your mind, especially if you're reading you know, 20, 30, 50 essays a day. There's always going to be, hopefully, at least one or two or a couple that st still live inside of you later on in the day or the next day. And this is where I kind of came in, but students have the same creative obstacles that screenwriters do, really any artist. One, there's the blank page phobia, which is just getting started. Where do I start? There's a lot of mishigas with that. It's, if I write this and I'm invested in that line, if I don't write it, I write something else, it's an opportunity cost, so basically I'm not going to do anything and I'm going to stay safe. Then there's the meandering narrative, which is, wow, I'm rocking and rolling now and I'm introducing all these ideas and now I'm up to 74 pages, but it's a 650 word essay, so we got problems. And then screenwriters, whom I enjoy working with very much, but honestly not as much as working with students on their essays, when they get into that creative zone, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like watching a student who believes themselves to be just on the, on the downside of this whole process, thinking, oh, I've got to live through this necessary evil of writing a, an essay, which, oh my God, how am I going to survive this? And then I got to, you know. And, and they suddenly start using our, our product, Essay Dog, using our process, and it completely subverts what their expectations are of writing an essay. Whereas a lot of people will say, write the first paragraph, write the first draft, bring it back to me, I'll mark it up, go back, write it again, sometimes as many as 13 times, according to some IECs I've spoke with. Essay Dog deconstructs that process, and I'm going to show you kind of how it does that. And it separates the creativity from the writing. The fact that they're coupled together is this big, um, sort of like, ogre's monster to students because they have to come up with ideas and they have to put them into the right format. We separate that. We separate that in the brainstorming stage. So let's look at the student as the protagonist in their own essay. We know what the protagonist in a movie is. The protagonist in the movie is the person who you're rooting for, who you're following. I reference it as an old movie. It's an old movie now, but Die Hard was the, like, the perfect action movie. So much so that every movie that followed for the next 10 years was Die Hard in a Boat, Die Hard in a Plane, Die Hard in Space. It created a whole genre of the smart action movie. And if, uh, you're, if you have a screenwriting side to you too, we give an hour and a half lecture on Die Hard and how it's the perfect movie. Um, and it really is in so many ways. The fact I'm talking about it 30 some odd years later, hopefully you're remembering what I'm talking about, speaks to how brilliant that was in its, in its construct. So, this advance. in movies, the goals of writing a protagonist are first and foremost, they have, the audience has to root for them. If the audience doesn't root for them, there's nothing at stake. The movie doesn't matter. I mean, I'm sure there's some movies out there, an M. Night Shyamalan movie called The Happening comes to mind. Sorry, he likes it. I'm sorry, okay, well, I'm gonna have to, nothing against Philadelphia. That movie, Mark Wahlberg's a superb actor, but halfway through I was hoping he'd die so the movie would be over. Honestly, it was just, it's just not, you don't root for him, okay? The character needs to be lovable. I don't, I don't mean likable. Tony Soprano was lovable, not likable. That's an example of the difference there. It needs to be relatable to the audience on some level. That person's values, what they're trying to accomplish, needs to be, have some value to you for you to want them to succeed because that's the goal of that character being in there. Otherwise, he's not a good protagonist. Choose another protagonist. In movies, in writing, we always have this, um, this mantra, show, don't tell. 
I don't want to hear how daring or how brave this guy is. I want you to open up with him climbing, like free climbing on Yosemite without any kind of nets. Then I know, without having to say more than anything, that this guy is a daredevil, he's confident, he's, it speaks volumes, what you show and what you don't have to tell. And that brings me to the next rule, which is we learn about protagonists, the good protagonists, we learn about them through their actions, their choices, and their reactions. If someone murders someone else and they go tell our protagonist and he goes, good, that's his reaction. We know a lot about him just from that. So let's put that protagonist into a situation. If he's supposed to be uh, this way, let's put him into a situation that shows the audience that without us going, Psst, he's this way. Okay, I'm going to continue with this. Protagonists are defined by their actions, choices, and reactions. This reveals the inner life of the character, okay, their values, their personal goals. I can go for hours on this alone, and don't tempt me. When a movie opens up, you're in the real world of the character before the thing happens that makes it that movie. So can I, can I mention Die Hard? Does anybody remember that movie? Okay. In the beginning of the movie, he's coming to Los Angeles, like many of you. Um, it's Christmas, and he's there not to battle terrorists in a skyscraper, which is what eventually happens. He's there, if you remember it, to fix his marriage. His wife lives in LA, he lives in New York. That's his real world, okay? He's introduced to a situation where he has to react, and that's where the, that's where the movie takes off. If he was just there to fix his marriage, it wouldn't be Die Hard. It would be some relationship movie. So out of his, his value in this is both to save his marriage, which is why he's there, and then to save his wife, which is, why, which is what it eventually becomes. And the choices he makes along the way really establish who this guy is. He's protective of, of his kids. He's protective of himself. He's smart. There's a lot of characteristics we can come up with, not by us knowing because he told us, but because we're watching the movie and we can decipher these things. And, and it's smart movie making, and, we're, and we are smart movie goers. The values and the drives for these characters and these students on the most basic level are very fundamental, okay? These are the values that each one of us hold dear to us and plays out, not necessarily on a daily basis, but in the scope of a year or a couple of years or, or months. And the, the students have a fundamental goal. For many of them, it's the same, but it plays out in different ways. They want to go to college because of X. There's a lot of, a lot of ideas and a lot of values attached to that. And in general, in movies, it's often, I mean, there might be some exceptions, but they're trying to save themselves. They're trying to advance themselves. They're trying to find or keep love. They're trying to achieve justice, right or wrong, avoid a consequence, and basically fulfill a personal goal. And the personal goal is key to all this because deep down, every human being has a personal goal. Oftentimes, they don't realize it, and oftentimes during the process that I'm about to show you, part of at least, in Essay Dog, they start to not only elucidate it, realize it, but they can actually concretize it. Now, in movies, we build protagonists by creating situations for them to make choices and take action. We create a hostage situation in the Nakatomi building in Century City so that Bruce Willis can do X, Y, and Z. Okay, we don't start with, maybe we start with that, we back into the character, but for the most part, we know the movie, the story we want to tell, we know how we want to portray our protagonist, and we build situations around them. This is exactly the reverse of essays, okay? In essays, we have the student, and I want to preface this by saying, it's our approach that we do not have them look at the essay prompt first. We think that kind of poisons the well a little bit. We found in our experience, and Teddy is far more experienced in this than I do. Um, I've been at this for two years with Essay Dog. But the students we've encountered both in workshops and online and on one-on-ones and, one -on and in webinars, they all have a story they want to tell, sometimes more than one. And even if they say, I have nothing, within a few minutes of starting our software, they're onto something and they're busy and don't bother me, I'm in the middle of something and they're brainstorming. Okay, I'm not saying that's the the best story to tell, and that's the story that's going to get them to college, but they have something they want to express. And they don't know the theme, they don't know what their personal goal is, they just know I want to relate this. And something's going to happen from that process, and something 99% of the time does. So we look at the situations, we look at the story that the student wants to tell, 
And then we look at the choices they make and the actions they take and the, the reactions they have within the context of that story, and that tells us about the character. The exact reverse of building a character in movies is taking a real-world situation a student encounters, reverse backing out of that. What choice did you make? Why did you make that choice? What were the, the other options? Why did you take that other option? And suddenly we start to reveal a theme. And the best we can hope for is that the essay reveals the four Ps. Their personality, their passion, their perseverance, and their potential. Now, not every essay has to reveal all four, all four of them, but at least one or two, sometimes three. Perseverance is not often the subject, you know, has to do with the subject matter. But the metadata that a reader gets from the story is like the metadata you get watching a movie in a sense. You have the story, you have the characters, you have the subplots, you have the motivations. Within the essay itself, you get the story, then you get a piece of the student's personality, at least a sliver that makes you, if it's done right, done well, makes you want to know more. You see what they're interested in, sometimes by the very choice of subject matter they chose for their essay. You see their perseverance in, in many uh, cases, and you see their potential. And their potential is not always, not always because of this, I want to do that. It's because of this, I grew, and this is the direction I'm growing in. And I don't know where it's going, but I feel like I'm on the right path. If you haven't heard of this guy, raise your hand. Okay. Aaron Sorkin is a very prolific writer and now director. He started off as a playwright who had one idea, and then it just kind of snowballed. He's one of the most prolific writers in, in the world right now. He's done television and film. He did The Social Network, West Wing. He just did Molly's Game. He's huge. He, was, he actually had this quote, I think, uh, a year or two ago at a Writers Guild conference. And it stands alone, and it stands for what we're doing here, which is the greatest vehicle ever invented for an idea as a story. Now, the idea is we want to, this student belongs in this school, OK? How do we express that? I want to be in this school. If the essay question is, or the prompt is, name a time that you had an obstacle and you persevered. If they start off the essay by saying, one time I faced a huge obstacle and then I persevered. <laughs> okay? But if they start off by saying, the river's usually three feet deep. That night it was 14 feet deep. Suddenly, whoa, what? Excuse me? And you're now into it. That's the difference between really telling a story and what we call writing an essay. The essay is good at information, gives across information, but the essay, the, the story rather, creates a relationship between the reader and the writer. And it does it by operating, by kind of running on these four cylinders. The plot, what happened? I broke my leg on the day of the big game. I chose this over that. It shows their personality. How? I'm, we're going to get to that as well. There's a process by which you can start something, be guided through it, and in the process, drill down to all these different elements that touch on your reasons and motivations, which reveal your, your values and your morals and who you are, in a way that doesn't overwhelm the reader, but it's intrinsic in the story you're telling. So this is how it goes. Student chooses a story. They have to tell that basic story. And I'm going to start off with how we do that in four sentences in a moment. Locate the choices in that story. And if not choice, is the reaction. How did the student process this information? The student is always the protagonist of their essay, but the student doesn't need to be the main character in the essay. It could be about their uncle who suffered and survived a terrible disease or an accident or something. The Great Gatsby wasn't about Nick Carraway. It was about Gatsby. Nick Carraway was our entry into that story. We wouldn't know how to judge Gatsby if it wasn't for Nick. We wouldn't know how to interpret what happened to this guy's uncle if it wasn't for him and his reaction to it. The motivation behind those choices are going to, again, reveal the inner life of of the student. The theme often emerges in the examination of the motives for the choices they make. And oftentimes the student isn't even aware of what that overall theme might be. We've encountered so many students who write about something because they want to write about it, 
and they realize later that the theme is actually family, I'll sacrifice anything for family, or I value integrity over winning, or money, or something like that, something close to them. Often the choice of writing about a certain subject reveals a lot about the student. The quarterback writing about something that's so unfootball like is an interesting choice. So, circle, circling back, the problem student writers face, the same problem screenwriters face. The evil blank page or the blank screen. And once they get past that and they're kind of rocking and rolling, this other problem comes in, which is now I'm, I, I'm flooded with ideas. I don't have any structure to this whatsoever. I'm just going to write down everything I got and somehow save, it, save the organization until later. And either way, they feel like they're on the losing side of it. And the consequence of that is insecurity about the work. They know there's a time deadline. They know there's a lot at stake here. They have parents who are trying to help and usually not being very helpful at all or the antithesis of helpful. A lot of anxiety, of course, the procrastination and everything else on this, uh, this little chalkboard. And, and the whole experience of writing the essay, or writing in general, is, leaves a very bad taste in their mouth. They often also have these debilitating myths, such as writers are born, not made. And I don't know about the, uh, sort of the, the quote unquote secular world, but I know, for example, these three individuals were not born writers. Anyone ever hear of David E. Kelly? David E. Kelly was a successful, by all, by all means, uh, real estate lawyer in Boston. And he had this idea to write a story about a guy, a lawyer who gets his other lawyer off the death row and finds out he's guilty. And, is, and he was trying to get a bunch of his friends who were writers to go write it. And they said, I got my own projects to write. You go. So he begrudgingly bought this $1,200 word processor. Gives you an idea of the time frame of this thing. And he said, all I want to do is make enough money back from this thing to pay for this word processor. Anyway, this script happened to, went to Hollywood through whatever means and happened across Stephen Bochco's desk, Stephen Bochco of Hill Street Blues. And Bochco at the time was looking for writers with a law background to write for LA Law. He brought Kelly out for a year and said, try it. If you don't like it, you go back to his, your firm. The firm let him have a year off to try it. And he never left. He ended up becoming the executive producer of LA Law, where it won its most, uh, most Emmys that year. Every actor who got up who won an Emmy said it's because of this guy over here. He went on to develop other series. And he wrote, I have friends of mine who worked for him. The guy writes longhand on legal pads and wrote three one-hour shows at the same time per week. Boston Public, um, Ally McBeal, and um, was it Boston Legal? Or a third one, I forgot. Barry Levinson graduated last in his class in Baltimore. He was actually taking his final exam while everyone else was lining up with their uh, you know, for, for the graduation ceremonies. He went off and did Diner. He did, uh, you know, he's doing a lot of HBO movies now with Al Pacino. It's not dependent on, he wasn't born into this, and he certainly didn't have the grades for it. John Singleton was basically an LA, LA urban kid who wrote what he knew. And it was one of the most compelling movies, stories, and success stories that, uh, that Hollywood's ever heard. And Hollywood loves these stories. He's now a fantastic producer, director, writer. He's very prolific. He wrote what he knew. Um, I need to have a big life in order to write a great essay. A lot of 16, 17 year olds think, well, man, I didn't fight in any wars. I didn't, you know, I didn't run a business into the billions of dollars and then run into the ground. I didn't go into space. What am I gonna write about? Seriously, what am I gonna write about? And the answer is that you can basically write anything as long as it, it, you can tell any story, as long as it's compelling, the telling of it, it can be a compelling story. I once had a, a group of people, I forgot the details of it, but I was telling the details of how I tied my shoes that morning. And I somehow was, it was so compelling that they're like leaning forward in their chair going, was it a double knot or was it a single knot? You know? That's one of my favorite stories. I put my son to sleep with that story. And I'm not a storyteller, so I don't need to know how to tell a story. The fact is everyone needs to know how to tell a story. They're not learning it in school these days. They weren't learning it years ago either, really, you, you know, really well, but now they're not really learning it at all. But what's the value in telling a story? Well, if you ever had to have a job interview, or you ever had to represent yourself, or plead a case in court, 
or start a company or a product. Uh, they're narratives. And stories are all around us. The news, everything on the news is a story coming from their, their story their, versus their story. It's all stories. Students, when they learn the skill of storytelling, it's going to serve them in all areas of their life, not just for this specific essay. Students now, when they have to write this essay, they somehow get it done, they leave it alone, they leave it behind, and I'm done forever. No. Here they pick up a skill. They acquire, they acquire a skill because it's an experiential process. So how do we do it? The secret of getting ahead is getting started. There's a Chinese proverb about that too, I believe. But the secret of getting started is breaking your complex, overwhelming tasks into small, manageable tasks and starting the first one. So where do we start? Okay. We start with four sentences. Every story has a fundamental structure. And we introduce it like this. There's the initial plan, the anticipated outcome, the pivot, setback, or change of circumstances, the, the thing that, def that makes a story a story. I went to the bank. That's not a story. I went to the bank and it was being held up. There's a story. Okay? And the discovery, the realignment of what the, of what the anticipated outcome was before the pivot to what it is now is the discovery. And it doesn't have to be, and now I'm going to give myself over to, you know, and, and work to solve hunger in the world. No, it has to be something even, it could be something very small. When the students take a story, they download or pull out, they break it down into four sentences, one sentence for each. Once they have that, they know they have the foundation on which they can build their story. A lot of students don't have this structure. They're not given the structure. And so they start building and building and building and realize that the foundation is broken. And they've got to start reinforcing the foundation while they're still trying to build. And it's very stressful and oftentimes a disaster. So we get them on like a table, the four pillars of the story, and then they can grow from there. And what do they do? I never, I never teach this part, but I'm going to tell you here because it's, it's relevant to what we're talking about. The next step is the primary motivation. They now look at the choices they make within that, the, the four sentences, and they have to find the reasons behind the choices, their reactions, because these reasons are their values at play. So after they have the four sentences, which is the basic structure of the story, they now start drilling down into the why. And that opens up a whole new universe of possibilities for them. We find out about this student by the choices they make not by them telling us, okay, which is the difference between essay and story. Now, yes, there are some essays that are just essays. They're position papers, okay, but we're not talking about those. We're talking about taking any prompt and couching it in the, clo in, in the close of a story, basically. So we took, randomly, the best essays, three of the best essays of 2016, according to Google or something, and we went through them and we marked up where, now these students didn't use Essay Dog because Essay Dog wasn't available to them. But we found in each of these essays that each one had an initial plan, an anticipated outcome, a setback, and a discovery, a setback pivot. Um, did they do it intentionally? No, but it's good storytelling. And good storytelling happened to make it to the best of college application essays of 2016. Now, questions I get are, so, do you have to write the initial plan? Is that going to end up in the final essay? No. None of this does, has to necessarily end up in the, final, in the final product. What these are, are touchstones for the student to understand their story and then navigate through those, that course. So the initial plan might be half a sentence. It doesn't have to be the whole sentence. It doesn't have to be five sentences. But yet when the student fleshes it out in the process, it might be, it might be 20 blocks of ideas. Okay, how do they narrow it down? Well, that's where you guys come into play is the IECs. Software will never replace the interpersonal relationship someone has with a student. So our process gets them to that, gets them to that first draft, or what I like to affectionately call, and Teddy's sick and tired of me calling it this, the clay on the potter's wheel. If anyone does pottery, I don't do pottery, but my understanding of pottery is you get all the clay on the potter's wheel, and then you start molding and shaping it. And when it's on the potter's wheel, you don't know if it, you know, no one can look at it and go, that's going to be a great vase or a plate or a dish or whatever. But the artist knows, and they help cut away. 
And so it's easier to cut away than to add on to it. So this process gets all the clay in the potter's wheel, then they can start carving. You start putting new clay on an old potter's wheel and you start the whole st structure, the integrity of the piece is now compromised. So the benefits of what we call the structured creativity. It's experiential. As the student goes through the process, they're actually learning about storytelling. It's nonlinear. It's an unconscious belief, but when we consume media, whether it's a movie or a TV show or a novel, we're consuming it in linear order. Page one, page 120, end credits. But the creation of those things are anything but linear. If you've ever seen a writer with the, with the index cards on the, on the floor of the kitchen and, the, you know, we're, put the scene over there and put that scene over there, that's how these things are made. Okay? I've been in writer's rooms where they go, okay, that, that's a great idea. We're going to put that in the third act. They're constantly moving things around. Unless you have the freedom to be able to do that and know how to do it properly, you're going to be stuck in this mindset that I, everything I do has to be gold up until, the, you know, it's not going to work that way. It's set up for failure. It's nonlinear so that you can, as you, as you go through the experiential part of it, you learn something, you go back, hey, I'm going to fix that. My discovery is not going to be this, it's going to be this. I'm going to amp it up. It's going to be, there's going to be more at stake. Brainstorming. Scientists have found that, that when people get into the creative zone, it's, it's blissful, it's euphoric. I already mentioned that students often come up with a theme about their lives, about the reason for this story that they didn't anticipate going into it. And it's often very personal, and they're, and they like, they're, they're touched by their own sensitivity to it. Decouple creativity from writing. Now I want to spend a second explaining this. I mentioned before how the students feel like if they're, if they're paying attention to sentence structure and grammar, it's just another burden. When we get into that, that brainstorming, number three, we just let it rip. We encourage them, don't worry about sentence. I don't care if you spell any, everything incorrectly. It's about the idea. And as one student told us when we were asking her, her, her reaction to using the process, she goes, you know, it's like building ideas upon ideas, not words upon words. At the idea level, they're free to brainstorm. And then, once you have all that material, then you can start putting it into the correct sentence structure and the paragraphs and, and the grammar. But until then, get the raw ideas out. And people are afraid to because everyone's going to be critical. You're going to see it, but it's not for them. When they're working in our platform, it's them in the screen. There's no one looking over their shoulders, no one watching them from the other side. The, we, we encourage them to just brainstorm it and just be free with it. And, and it makes a world of difference. And this increased fun in telling the story. They get to the point where they now show it to you, and it's, it's just all the ideas right there. And now you can work with them. And you can also, in, in, in our platform, see the raw material, see where they, where they dug deep and where they didn't. But what you're getting is the full expression, the authentic expression, and more of the student. And now you can help them carve away the fat. There's that, that great line that someone told me where Michelangelo was asked, oh, I can not get you Italian. <laughs> But <laughs> that's my Italian. Um, uh, that's why I'm behind the camera, usually. Um, he was asked, it's genius, how did, you, how did you sculpt David? And he goes, it was actually very simple. I took a big piece of marble, and I cut away everything that wasn't David. That's how you're going to help them with these essays. Any story could be compelling. I mentioned the shoelace story. Okay. Smaller stories against the bigger backdrop. Teddy mentioned the Houston flood. How many college application essays are going to have the Houston flood as the backdrop to it? Too many? I don't think there's such a thing. I looked at the number of World War II movies that have been produced. There's like hundreds of them. Okay? I actually... <laughs> Saving Private Ryan, Dunkirk, Fury, Hacksaw Ridge, and Glorious Bastards, The Imitation Game, Valkyrie, Atonement, Defiance, The Pianist, The Pearl Harbor, The Winds of War, Life is Beautiful, Monuments Man, Black Book, Enemy at the Gates, I go on and on and on. Spielberg himself did seven movies that took place with World War II as the backdrop. Three of them were, or four of them were Indiana Jones movies. Okay? There's no limit to how many World War II movies you can tell, and there's never going to be the definitive World War II movie that's not at least ten times as long as World War II was, because there's so many perspectives. Okay? So the smaller story is, if you can imagine, any of, these any of these movies against the backdrop of World War II. So any of these students' stories against the backdrop of, of, the, of, of the hurricane, you know, it's going to be a unique story. And every story will be, can be as unique as the student telling it. Now I'm going to tell you, before I hand it over to Teddy, about 
what we, who are, we affectionately call our mac and cheese person. This is Faith, who we met at the aforementioned, uh, one of the aforementioned, no, you didn't mention it. We did a workshop in Philadelphia last year for first gen and underserved students. And Faith came in and her aspiration was to go to SJU, St. Joseph's University. And she had written, for all intents and purposes, had written her essays and was just here as a formality because there was also informational classes about scholarships and, and student aid. But she came into the essay dog workshop and she, she's a go-getter, she did it. And so um, she sat and she wrote an essay about making mac and cheese, which I call, it's like the LA, like the law and order of essays. It's procedural, but underneath it there's story and characters and meaning. So I'm just gonna show you briefly parts of her essay, okay, and she used essay dog for this, but essentially the story is this. She was away in, in some kind of program. She was away for a while. She was coming back. She and her friends were going to reunite. She was going to cook them all dinner, this great mac and cheese and bacon and blueberry pie. And it was going to be, you know, bring them all back together. And, um, and it was a complete disaster. And she, this is the first paragraph. The first paragraph starts, it was, it was after I'd returned from four weeks away at college. I'd missed my friends dearly and couldn't wait to see them. I had been planning the event for a week. That's her initial plan. She was planning this event. I stayed up the previous night going through cookbooks to find the perfect recipe, and I told friends it was going to be a great meal. That's the anticipated outcome. Bacon, mac and cheese, burgers, blueberry pie. Sounds, in, sounds easy enough to put together, right? That's what I thought the night before, what will go down in history as the great mac and cheese disaster. Commercial, and then, come, okay, no. okay? That's the hint at the pivot. Now the real pivot. The bacon, this is among this horror story of, of kitchen disasters, but the bacon grease burned our arms when we messed up on the cheese. Next, the milk mixture boiled over and we'd forgotten to preheat the oven. Just one thing after another, okay? But out of this came a discovery. Throughout the cooking disaster, my best friend continuously stepped in to save me. I laughed at my mistakes and we decided to start a YouTube channel featuring the two of us cooking together. So I realized that failure is never the end, especially when good friends are there to save you. And the discovery goes further. Now she used essay dog, and this is all woven in to the essay itself. It changed my perspective on failure. I've always been afraid to try new things because I'm afraid to, because I'm afraid to fail. And then she goes on and really cites the theme. Failure is inevitable. This is the last sentence in her, in her essay. But if you surround yourself with the right people, you can turn a failure into something beautiful. Now as the reader of this, she's someone I, I want to be around. I want her on my campus. I can see her in my freshman class. Now, I told you she wanted to go to St. Joseph's University, and I told you she had already written what she considered the essays that she was going to present in school. Well, she ditched those, used this one, and she got accepted at Davidson College, University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and the Meyerhoff Scholars Program, University of Maryland, Gemstone Honors College. And I don't think she's decided which one she's going to go to at the time that she told me this. So I'm going to turn it over to my esteemed colleague, Teddy Barnes, and uh, thank you for, for listening to my part. And we'll take some questions at the end. We, we've been uh, so blessed to be working with uh, students around the, the country at workshops that we do. And uh, when we talked about Faith and her great story about mac and cheese, it just makes us smile. It really makes it worthwhile. And I know everyone here has stories about that because you're, you're dedicated to young people. And, and uh, you know, I, I, I find gratitude and uh, worth knowing that, you know, maybe I held a small part in their life and, and getting them to where they want to go to college and, and making that process a little bit more meaningful. From my perspective as say a scholarship judge or looking at an essay through the lens of a college admissions uh, committee, uh, certain things really stand out. I think first and foremost, you know, putting yourself in the position of a reader. And in the reading season, there's sometimes reading 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 applications, including essays and sometimes supplemental essays, depending on the tier of the college. Uh, it's, it's really a challenging thing for someone to do. If you submit, if your student submits sort of a flat, bland essay, they're going to be lost into the woodwork, especially um, with these top tier schools. Uh, one of the things I, I really try to drive in with my students is to start off strong. I, I loved Faith's first paragraph. It, it brought me in as a reader. I wanted to, I wanted to find out more. Um, I kind of wanted to have mac and cheese and a burger with her, but um, 
I still do. Uh, but the, the first two or three sentences are so important. And in this process, uh, they're not writing an autobiography. Um, they, if you wanted to do that, two, three, four hundred pages will be sufficient. 650 words. So I think you, you really need to bring the reader in and understand that you have to keep their attention throughout the, the whole process of reading the story. We talk about students and that the, this is their story. And you can teach them so many different things. And every story is going to be different because it's, it's their own. And one of the things we really need to do is empower them to write their authentic uh, story, to define their authentic writing voice. So it's important that the subject matter is something that is really uh, important to them. Again, starting small, a small story, drilling down, and it really illustrates who they are as a person. And what I was talking to a colleague of mine, and she, uh, uh, she was at Brown for 25 years in the missions office. And she said, she said it so much better than I'll be able to relate to you, but she said that the essay needs to be a part of the narrative flowing through a student's candidacy. And she's right. Um, and you don't want um, the essay to just regurgitate all the extracurriculars. That's boring. I mean, I read that, um, I get angry at the student. It's sloppy. It's, uh, you're, not, you're not showing me something new in, in, this, in this read. So I think those are things that are important to tell a, uh, tell a student and how they can really get going with their story. Um, again, I think the brainstorming thing, sometimes just talking about movies is a, a great way to start. But really starting a conversation without saying, hey, we're going to brainstorm now. That'll be like, oh my gosh, I, you know, you're telling, you tell someone, hey, you need to calm down. It was like, I'm, I'm not going to calm down, but, or just be calm. You're asking someone to be calm, and it, it, it tenses them up. If you can kind of get them into a nice, comfortable conversation that may lead to some brainstorm, I think that's, that's a wonderful way to do it. Um, and they do. They have great stories inside them. And I, I think it's really important that these stories are important to you and that you're an advocate for them uh, in this process. But also, you need to be able to say with the draft, and I, I was talking to someone earlier today, and I said, there hasn't been a student who's handed me a draft of their essay, think, and they all think it's their final draft. They do, and you're like, uh, you, can, you can be kind to them saying, there's more in this story, there's more inside you that hasn't gotten onto the page yet, okay? And we're, we're going to take the next step. And then it comes back to you. There may be some more things in there that they haven't told you yet. Uh, one of the mistakes earlier in my, my career working with students, with working with essays, I would pour all the information on them at, at once, thinking from first draft to second draft, the second draft was the last draft. Uh, I think you have to be patient. You have to give them uh, enough information, enough advice to move on to the next step. But also knowing that that next draft is going to be a little bit closer. And, and then you, there may be something new that you hadn't seen in that essay that you can say, hey, you know, this is fantastic. This is a revelation. Or now you have a couple more notes. Now we're going to work on these things. So you have to be committed to that this is a multi-draft process. And that takes time. It takes time. Um, Again, uh, this is not, I mean, 650 words is not an autobiography. Um, you have to, I, I tend to ask students not to have stories that bounce from year to year to year to year. Um, I, I tend to ask them to do a small story that really, uh, that they really uh, expose who they are. Um, again, remember your audience. Um, you've got to grab, grab the reader as soon as you can and make it compelling throughout. Um, take, take risks. For me, I mean, Howard's talking about the four Ps. Uh, passion, I, all my, I really try to convey with my students, you've got to be passionate. Passionate about the subject matter. If you don't care about what you're writing about, then don't write about it. A lot of the times, and you'll get, you'll sit down with a student and they'll say, my mom wants me to write about this extracurricular. I mean, 
how, how many people has that happened to? I mean, if I had more than two arms, they'd be up. Um, it happens all the time, and that's a part of your job in trying to work with the student, work with the family, and being able to tell them, hey, this is a really good subject matter, and let's, let's get excited about it. And then here, you, you've already told that story in your extracurriculars, all right? And we don't need to go down that road anymore. They know that you're really good at Latin and that you won the Latin award at your, your school. Great for you, but let's, I mean, there, there may be something really amazing about something you found out about yourself with studying Latin. Let's, let's talk about that. I'm interested in that. Um, it's, it's important that they, they're recounting, but then they're reflecting. Howard talked about sort of the discovery. That's sort of the reflection of it all. Oh my gosh, cliches. Oh. Avoid, uh, they're just uh, the eye roll. When I'm, when I'm reading my scholarship um, essays, and uh, cliches come out, and I'm just, oh my gosh. It's just, you're, you're eye rolling, and you're like, why are you doing this? And you, you've got to be better than this, okay? And, um, and stories that are commonplace. I mean, you know, students sometimes, they're, they're out of a sense of disadvantage that they're, in a sense, it's like, I've got to convince the admissions committee to accept me. And one way a lot of kids fall into their trap is that if they pity me, they'll be like, oh, we really like this kid, they've had a tough life, and you know, oh, we're, we're gonna let this kid in because I feel sorry for him. No, I mean, and so many kids will say, you know, my dog Fido died, and it was really awful. And you know, out of the 100 essays that, that reader went through that day, four about Fido, uh, or six are about the gr dead grandmother. And all those things are real, but you know, it, it's much more interesting if you're gonna talk about the death of your grandmother, maybe something really extraordinary happened when you went to her funeral. Maybe you met a long lost uncle that you didn't even know was, existed and you talked to that uncle for an hour. And that, that I wanna read about. Um, you found out all these new things about your grandmother or your family. Oh my gosh, tell me more. Um, are you upset that your grandmother died? Yeah, I get that. I get that. But don't try to rely on the sympathies of the admissions committee because they, they're, they're sort of hardened to it. And um, again, you want to develop, you want to help them develop a story that's really interesting. Not something, and we talked about the, the, the writer as the, the hero. We want them to be a hero. We want to empower them to think, you know, I am the hero of my own story. And that doesn't mean I, I have to, you know, th you know, win the state championship in football and be the, the star quarterback. There's so many different ways that you can be a hero. And it can be extraordinary. It's, and sometimes it's the small things that illustrate really who they are at the core. I mean, the mac and cheese story with Faith is, is amazing. I mean, I read that story and I'm like, I can close my eyes and know that she's like the go-to uh, young woman on her dorm that she's gonna be a great friend and kids on her dorm are gonna go back on Thanksgiving freshman year and they're gonna talk about, oh my gosh, I met this great person, um, Faith, and you know, we're best friends and you know, maybe she doesn't make great mac and cheese, but uh, it's, it, she's, she's a part of my college experience. And colleges are looking for pieces like that in their communities. I mean, we, I mean, taking a step back from what's happening at Harvard, but really looking at the diversity that colleges are, are seeking, they're looking for compassionate, intriguing people like Faith. That, you know, on, on the, the surface, she's like, she's sort of the suburban, suburban girl from uh, Maryland. And, you know, what's extraordinary about her? You read that story. She's extraordinary. You really want to get to know her. And, yeah, so anyway, we're, you know, we're just so lucky to be able to work with kids like that. Okay. Oh, one of the things I hate. Oh, it was like when in the beginning, you know, dear admissions committee were faithfully submitted and, you know, I'm like, oh, you know, you don't waste my time with those, those words. I mean, you know, just write the story. Don't suck up. It's no one likes to suck up. Oh, it, it, it happens. I, I mean, I, I see it all the time. So anyway, um, 
this is the, this is the tricky one, avoiding off-limit topics. There's sometimes that students feel really passionate about a specific topic, but it's completely inappropriate for the, uh, for the subject matter. And I, I was talking to my friend Rebecca from Brown, and she said that about 10 years ago, they had this student who wrote an amazing essay. An amazing essay. It was an incredible story. But what did she write about? She wrote about losing her virginity. Yeah, and, and they had meetings about, about her. They had meetings. They were like, like, what are we going to do? I mean, everyone else on, like, her credentials were fantastic. But then they're like, we've got this essay. Incredibly well written, great story. She was flat out rejected. At the end of the day, she said, great writer, great story. Really poor decision to write about this. And that was not the only story that she could have told about herself that would have been compelling, shocking. God only knows what her mom said. Uh, but, uh, so, uh, I, I, I don't know, I don't know that, uh, um, but she, what's, what's that? Yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Um, and, and we, yeah, and those are the eating disorders are really, really tricky. And like kids are saying, talking about one of, one of those topics to sort of avoid is, you know, if they've gone through something and they're using this as a catharsis, that they're writing this, that somehow at the end of writing it, that they're, they're feeling better about themselves, that can be a real trap. Um, because again, it could be, they're, they're, they're really not telling a story. They're like, they, they, this is more something you should be telling a therapist. Um, and, and these are things that, um, you know, working with, with them as a writing mentor, we need to be able to say, great subject, more appropriate talking to a therapist. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm on the type wire with you right now. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you could, you, it could, it could fall into, you know, I was talking to Laura earlier, just like, it could fall into, you know, someone who's really sympathetic to that um, or not. I mean, I, I would avoid, I would avoid sort of, that, I mean, he may want to talk about, you know, something very specific, some sort of policy that's important to him uh, and, and focus it on that and how, yeah, okay. And, and one of the things, and this is something that I've, I've become a convert. Earlier in my career, you know, I'd look at the prompt, I'd look at the common app or say, all right, which one do you want to do? And, you know, all right, we'll start writing about number one. And, it really took away the creative process. And, and, and I think you know, one of the things that you need to have in this process is time. Time with the student uh, to be able to say, listen, we're gonna start here. I can close my eyes and kind of know where this may go, but um, you know, you've got seven prompts. It will fall into one of those categories eventually. And, and number seven is just the best because you make your own Create your own essay prompt. Uh, so you, you can't really go wrong. And also, it gives them um, the liberty to just write about what they want to write about, as long as it's not about losing their virginity or anything like that. Um, so anyway, so uh, what do we have next? So we, we talked a little bit about you know, how to start the brainstorming process with your students. And like, I like to sneak up on them just with conversation. Um, and get them going and, and kind of figure out what their day is, you know, things that are happening, um, you know, with their friends, if they saw a movie, you know, favorite show, what they've been reading, and really kind of go from there. And, um, but again, I, I, I think it's important that they, that it's genuine, that you, I mean, I'm really interested. I mean, I, I find them so much more interesting than I find myself, because they are. I mean, they're, they're I mean, to be a 17-year-old, 
oh my gosh, it's mind blown. I mean, what they're going through, it's, it's extraordinary. And I, I think and you, you have to be passionate about kind of what they're going through. Going through college, applying to college now is so much harder than the 10 years ago when I applied to college or 20, whatever I did. But um, it, 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 God, they're, just, they're so overscheduled. They're, it's so demanding. It's so much more competitive. I, I just, I look at these kids and I, I'm, I'm in awe of them. And they deserve our respect. But also, we, I want to I find out what's inside them. I, and I want them to show the admissions committee how extraordinary they, they are. And it can start with something very, very ordinary. And just drilling down, it, it's so much fun. I love working with my kids. One of the things I, you know, I, we talked a little bit about starting strong. Are there any, um, I, I just kind of stole this from 10 opening lines from uh, a Stanford admissions essay that kids got in, yeah. I mean, that's just kind of my, how I, I kind of deal, deal. and you know, they're, they're kids that, you know, they may, there's one kid I'm working with right now who's fantastic. He's, uh, he's out in Pittsburgh, and his name's Sid, and he, you know, sit down, he wants to go to work. And he was like, you know, be brutal, tell me exactly how I can, I can, uh, I can improve this. And, you know, and that's, and that's what he needs, and we kind of get into it. Um, there are other kids that, you know, we, we ease into it. So, you know, I, I don't think that, you know, I couldn't tell you, hey, I have four, three or four, you know, questions or statements that sort of ease, but it, it's more based on, on the individual and just really kind of caring about what they, what, what, what's going on in their world. Um, you know, so that's, I wish I could give you, hey, here are four, four winning comments or questions, but, uh, yeah, oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that there are just some probing questions that you can ask and, you know, things that are really important to, to them. What did you do on the weekend? Tell me about your friends. I mean, all those sorts of things. Um, you know, tell me about your favorite class. You know, who's your favorite teacher? Why, why do you feel more comfortable in math class than in English class? Um, you know, and, and just asking questions that, that they know the answer to. Sometimes they, they're like, I don't know. I mean, my 12-year-old boy is like, how, he, I, he comes home every day from school. It's like, how does school go? I don't know. Um, and it's tough. And some kids are like that. And my son is. Um, but you know, I, I, I wish I had like, you know, ten things to, to say to a, to a, you know, a sixteen-year-old to kind of bring them out of their shell. But some, I mean, it would be disingenuous. I, oh my gosh, I'd have a lot of money. Um, what, uh, you, you had a follow-up question? Yeah. So, if there's no real prescribed way to do that, let's say. Yeah. Yeah. Some, some, uh, I'm going to call facts. Let's yeah. Facts. How do I get those facts into those four things that you want to start with those four sentences? So how do you get all that stuff and then say, okay, now let's work on getting yeah. four things? Well, I mean, I think at the point that you're talking, I mean, with Sid, he, you know, you know, I, we just went back and forth. I, I did a brainstorming session with him that took us 20 minutes to get to something that was great uh, but it it took a while and yeah and I mean it I mean you kind of know greatness when you see it it's hard to describe it but I mean but when he he got but we were just doing probing questions and he was answering I was like yeah I'm not, I'm not feeling that or you, know, you kind of said that in in your uh, personal statement let's not go back there you did a great job there but you know now you're doing the Cornell Supplemental, and that's a whole new ball game. And how are you going to deal with that? And what are they really asking? Um, but so, I, you know, I think it's the ability to, to be genuinely interested in who they are and then asking questions, but also just kind of trust yourself. It's like something that would interest you may definitely interest um, someone uh, who's reading their, their, their essay. But yeah. The, the end result is really something that's really powerful. 
the, uh, and, and, but, but what you did, no, but something you did was extraordinary. You're like, you probed to figure out things that she was passionate about. And then, and then you, you said, hey, start writing about that. And I mean, it, when, when, I'm, like, when I'm on my 70th uh, application, and I'm just like, oh my gosh. And there hasn't been a good essay in 70 applicants. And I'm just like, this is torture. But when there's one that really is extraordinary, I, I, like, I get teary. I'm like, and I'll never, I'm, I'm never going to meet these kids. But I'm like, I'm so grateful. Um, but the readers are too. If they, if they, and like, and what, what's the first name of the, the student? Miriam. I mean, but like, I read that story. If I'm reading that story, what it tells me is that she's a serious student. She's passionate about writing. And she's willing, she has enough guts to go to the administration and express herself. That's extraordinary. I want that, I want, I want Miriam at my college. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, she was right. Um, I, I guess at, at this, what are we talking about? 4.30. Um, Howard and I will, will hang out here. Um, thank you so much. Sir. I, I, I love talking about this stuff. Thank you so much. Come visit us. Yeah. Come visit us. We'd love to continue this.